Welcome back to the Shoutout Podcast. We have a special episode lined up for you today. And as always, thank you for tuning in, showing love, and supporting the channel. We appreciate it very much. This episode of the Shoutout Podcast is brought to you by Digital 112, Naglin's leading creative agency. From creative designs to strategic marketing, they are your choice in shaping success stories. Trusted by government departments, agencies, and private businesses, Digital 112 is setting the new benchmark for the creative industry. Hello everyone, um, I hope you're all doing good. Welcome to the 27th episode of the Shoutout Podcast. I am looking forward to this episode because my guest today is someone that I've been trying to get for a while on top of the wish list of the Shoutout guest. Um, he is an architect by profession, but his work goes way beyond that, being involved in a multitude of activities and initiatives that spreads all across Naglan and in- impacts our state and our people in a very positive way. An inspiration to many, including myself. Thank you so much for wel- uh, coming on the podcast, Richard Bello. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, so, it's a privilege. Uh, privilege is mine, but I think all the pestering has finally paid off. <laughs> I've been trying to get you on for a while. I and had actually promised you also that I, since I'm not used to doing uh, this type of interviews also, but... I do understand. I do understand. I, uh, it was a commitment to you, so... I. I <laughs> appreciate that a lot so we have a lot of things to talk about mm-hmm. today um i'm looking forward to it why don't uh, we'll start with the shout outs yeah we'll get that done and then we'll dive into the other topics right yeah, yeah. so i'll start and then yeah, you can yeah. follow it okay. my shout out for this episode goes out to an aspiring naga politician way across the uh, you know the other side of the globe okay. uh, her name is esther achumi dennis she's uh, based in the u.s and is a real estate entrepreneur she will be vying or she will be running on the Republican ticket, mm-hmm. um, vying for the F- Justices of Peace seat in uh, 5th District in Arkansas. So the Justice of Peace is basically the legislative branch of the um, uh, state government. So I, uh, a shout out to Rita also who broke the story on Morning Express uh, where I read about it and found it very interesting and inspiring. So a big shout out to Esther. And wishing you all the best. My shout out is uh, to the young dreamers, the entrepreneurs, to the teachers, to anyone who gives their time selflessly, to the young people who spares their time, and people who work hard, and knowing that tomorrow it will be a better day for all of us. And that's nice. I think uh, that is what we need a lot more of in our society today. People who are willing to sacrifice their now for, yes. you know, a better tomorrow. You are someone that is, I think, uh, I think you'd agree when I say like very low key. You, <laughs> you don't like to be out there as such. But uh, even with that being said, I feel like a lot of people know your name. They might not know you personally or exactly what you do, but Richard Bello, you know, they know. They know. And so, but then uh, they don't know the extent or what it is that you exactly do. So, before we get in, I, I like. Why don't you describe yourself in like a nutshell about like what are the things that you do and um, that we'll get into in detail later. But just mm. like you know, in brief, if you were to say like describe Richard Bello. To actually, one of the main thing that I do, and this is where we position ourselves also. Mm. Over the years, I've come to learn and believe that. We should resonate with what, how we think, what we speak, and what we do. And that three has to come together. Mm. And for me, I'm committed to making sure that all my efforts are there to create a small step for the next generation also. Mm. 
So when I uh, shifted back from Bangalore to here as an architect, I started working with bamboo and in bamboo I knew that every bamboo building that I built, some money is going back to our local people, mm. to their villager, to their villages, to the skilled workers. So my activity in one way is also impacting. So then the, when we started farming and all these activities also, it is... Uh, Everybody knows that there's so much of potential, but we were not able to make it work. Mm. We were not, our farmers were still struggling. Right. And someone had to come in and intervene or study what is this. So my activity, whatever I've been engaged in has been uh, something to do with livelihood, something to do with uh, uh, creating a small impact in terms of uh, the future gen generation. Mm. Yeah. I like that you consider yourself like a, a social entrepreneur, something of that sort. In in a sense, yes, uh, uh, a social entrepreneur, but uh, it's kind of a hype term because <laughs> as an entrepreneur also, uh, like I would not be here in this position had it not been for a lot of people who supported us. Of course. So there's not so much of a struggle in my journey mm -hmm. uh, in that sense because people, there have been a lot of patrons uh, in my journey and mm. a lot of uh, mentors. That's a blessing. So things, uh, uh, things was easy for me also, but at the same time, if, it, if there's a broad-based definition, it will be a social entrepreneur. Mm. A uh, lot of things that you're touching on, which uh, I'm very curious on, and I think a lot of the listeners will also be wanting to know more about. But before we get into that, um, I do this all the time. It's mm. uh, just a breeze through the past and, uh, you know, the backstory, yeah. just your childhood. Uh, take us through and yeah. up until, you know. the. So, in a nutshell, to raised up by a single mom after my mom passed away when I was in class 10. My foster parents, uh, Francis Bello and Zibu Bello, my mother, my foster mom, they took care of us, sponsored all our education, and uh, we are more than a family because my foster mom took care of me from the time when I was very small also. Mm. My elder brother is an advocate in the Supreme Court, based in Delhi. Okay. My younger brother, Herbert is in Australia, Beatles, uh, he works with Vodafone International, so he'll be in Germany this time. My younger sister, Vime Junior, is a interior designer based in US, and the youngest, Meneño, she takes care of the family now. Mm. I did my schooling in uh, Holy Cross, Dimapur, so okay. I was raised up, uh, I was born in Kohima, but raised up in Dimapur. Dimapur. Mm. That also allowed me to travel all over Nagaland because uh, getting raised up in Dimapur is very unique, you know. Mm. You don't see any, even if there, there are issues, we don't see any tribalism here in Dimapur. Really, uh, yes. We really learn to work with everyone. We don't even uh, consider non-locals also uh, outsiders. Mm. Here too, we manage, uh, we learn to... Uh, and the, uh, adapt with the situation. We, coexist. Uh, yeah, we learn to coexist also. So, I was uh, uh, schooled in the Holy Cross. Then, from there, I went to St. Anthony Shilong. Mm. St. Anthony Shilong was uh, the game changer, actually, for mm. me. Because the fathers there gave me a lot of responsibilities. What, what class were you like when you went to Shillong? No, Age? 11, 12. 11, 12, okay, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. So pre-university. So I had to initially, every day in the morning, I had to play guitar in the church, piano sometimes, and at 6 a.m. And um, moving into a hostel environment from a non-hostel environment was like mm. really back-breaking. But that responsibility, which was given to me, allowed me to handle situation better. From there, 
I moved to Bangalore to, for my architectural studies. Then uh, I worked there for some time. Before I passed out also, I, I completed my architecture in 1999. But uh, before I passed out, I started working there. But in 2002, I moved back. When I was in Bangalore, um, I worked with a couple of architects short time, but um, the more significant was uh, I worked with, I did my internship apprentice apprenticeship under architect Chitra Vishwanath. Mm. She's a renowned uh, figure and a mentor again. So she works with sustainable architecture, mud architecture. Mm. Allowed me to see one side of architecture, which I did not experience in college. You don't really see that. Mm. Then I had my senior Arjun Nambichan, who was like um, the best friend of Rahul Dravid. Mm. He called me and he, I worked with him for another three years there. What happened is uh, I got to see the other world of architecture, uh, working with software, high tech companies. We did a small toilet uh, renovation also for uh, Rahul David himself. Mm. And then uh, I got chance to take kids, spastics, uh, uh, um, people with Down syndrome to meet him and uh, click photo with him. Then we got uh, personally got involved with uh, Sunil Joshi's um, parents' ka house in Mysore. So uh, that's Javaga Srinath, then Sunil Joshi's uh, apartment and mm. got to see uh, their lifestyle also, I mean, in a sense, like their requirements. Yes. And then I work with uh, Hindustan Labor um, Quality Walls Division. We won as a competition. So I, I did the dining hall. No, just one second to cut you off, but yeah. just in, for those that don't know, because the names that you're mentioning were pretty, uh, you know, cr cricketers, basically, but uh, like maybe this generation might not know might about them. Know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Sunil yeah, yeah. Joshi, Javagar Srinath and also uh, before you we go further, I'll just pull you back a little bit. And I just want this question that I always like to ask the guests is like when you were growing up, before you reached the uh, you know, level where you were uh, got into architecture, mm what were like what were some of the dreams or what were like you know did you have like a set goal or what what were you thinking during your formative years as a teen uh, while growing up you know like the, uh, we grew up in an era where there was no internet and all no? mm. but music was a hot scene mm. and every uh, either you're a musician or you're a carpenter trying to build your own guitar or something. <laughs> and it was like a hobby. And uh, for me, I thought maybe uh, I was just uh, fantasizing about the situation. What if I become a cook? Mm. Uh, I really wanted to start in a small hotel or something as a helper. <laughs> I, I, I was like really thinking... I was not uh, dreaming of becoming doctor, engineer, or anything. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to complete my schooling because I didn't. I didn't want to really wake up early every day now, mm -hmm. to, because we are uh, we were in Fort Mile, uh, Tihupar, and from there to, to Holy Cross, Cross yeah. we had to like really get up early, and so I I did could not risk to fail, but then career wise, I just wanted to see how. It would be if I started as a helper in a hotel and then the, would I become the cook or would I become the manager or how would it be? <laughs> no. so it was just a, a fancy. So when I told my family well, that that was like uh, my foster parents, mm. they were like, okay, you can do whatever you want, but first you complete your education. <laughs> uh, so we agreed to do up to PU. Okay. So then when PU happened, pre-university happened, then I started thinking like, okay, maybe I want to really uh, uh, create the work on the Nagami's comic. So since, Nagami's comic. Yeah. Uh. Since I uh, I used to draw and paint, and I also participated in Naga Week, uh, Nagas Ninety. There was a exhibition, uh, and even by this uh, NSF, and also participated with my oil paintings and also mm. now my thing shifted a little bit from cooking to painting, painting. then someone gave me the idea that commercial art would be good and then 
I thought, okay, let me try commercial art. But then, uh, you know, there was always a pressure uh, in Nagaland become a doctor or an engineer, depending on your mark. Right, right. So when I passed my pre-university in first division, suddenly every, people would be like, there would be pressure to uh, to go for this line or that. Mm. Uh, I did not, luckily my family understood that they don't push me to necessarily to this or that, but uh, they discouraged my idea of starting my hotel and this thing, that thing, man. Mm. So that time I went down to uh, Mumbai also, to JJ School of uh, Fine Art. To see how you apply, and they said that there were quota for Nagaland like three uh, seats. Mm. But uh, when I visited and when I saw the hostel facility, it was very far, and then the the idea of living in a city scared me a bit. Mm. So then I came back, reassessed, and then. Went for architecture. Mm. How did that come about? Architecture was it just like architecture was uh, everyone was also concerned. My whole family, my from my foster parents, my uncle's side, we have a big uh, family. Mm. Everyone was concerned about where I end up or where I turn up, and they, they used to have small small meetings. Mm. Because I used to come up with this weird idea that I want to do this, I want to do that. Mm. And uh, then it was uh, one of my aunt, Daisy Messer. Mm. Mm. One day she said, uh, Richard, I thought about it and I think architecture would be better for you because you love to draw and paint. And it's also technical. It's a technical course also and I think you'll do well. Then... That's how maybe I started thinking, okay, architecture should be okay for me. At mm. least I can draw. And so that's how I got into it initially. Yeah. Okay. So then fast forward and you were talking about all the various, uh, you know, uh, you were interning at first or apprenticeship. Appre- intern, yeah, intern, yeah, intern basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then you would worked on these projects and all. And what, because you weren't there for too long, right? Mm. What, made you decide on returning home and what was that so inspiration that is, behind that? Yeah, That is a very important uh, decision mm. and a very important phase. Right. Because I was kind of settled in Arjun Nambishan's office mm. and it was a good working environment. Mm. All of them were very uh, good to me also. The whole uh, family there and the work environment was good. But uh, engineer Rocco Sale, uh, I, uh, his, uh, Dr. Sedevi's younger brother, mm. he was working as an SDO here in PH18. He, he also studied his um, six, seven years, my junior, maybe. Mm. Uh, my senior, sorry, my senior. So he used to come down to, he, he also studied, passed out from Bangalore University. Okay. Once in a while, he used to come down and I took him showed my uh, where I was working, how my activity was. Mm. And two, three times he came down and then he said, no, Richard, you have to ship back to Nagaland. Mm. Because the most important thing he told me, corruption exists in Nagaland because there's no work culture mm. among our generation. And we have to create a work culture. And uh, you come, we'll set up an office together and then we'll also co- conduct training And uh, this is kind of uh, a very uh, a time when I could stick with my office and build up my career, Mm. uh, take it higher up, and then maybe come at a later date Mm. uh, as somebody Mm. and come and influence more people or start as zero with nobody. Mm. But then... I don't know, like, if I went into this company with a more permanent commitment, then I may not be able to quit very early also. Mm. But then also, again, my younger brothers were at a time when they were also undecided whether to go for higher education and all these issues were there at home. So they needed my presence back at home. So I shifted at that time and then... uh, 
started conducting training. Engineer Okosele went on to become a contractor and he gave up his government job also, but he went to become a contractor. So uh, we could not really work together because um, since I was not really interested in uh, contracting mm-hmm. and all this. So I, uh, I came back at that point of time. And then uh, this was one of the reasons why, and also the other thing was that in the city, you know, mm. I had participated in enough competitions and I felt uh, the architect uh, is more of uh, working for the rich people. Mm. Like unless you have enough money, you have no need for an architect. But when I go to the site, I see a lot of construction workers with their kids. The whole family had shifted for that construction project. Mm, project mm. And these kids have, cannot go to any school because you don't know like when they will be shifting again. So here we are architects with five years of education, trained with, with the latest, latest tool, designing the latest building, mm. um, talking about um, uh, not worrying about how much it will cost. Mm. It's like uh, very uh, high, uh, high cost uh, project. Uh, when we work with Ivega Corporation Interiors, one floor was itself costing about two crores at that time. Mm. So it was big money. But there at the site, when you see, you have the poorest of the poor working side by side, helping to achieve the dream no, of this corporate world. Mm. It was, in a way, it was disturbing uh, in one sense, like... Uh, Understood, yeah. So Saturday, I would spend some time with the kids, trying to teach them on and off, like whenever I get time, Saturdays. Uh, we used to give small, small tutorial, well, mm. English, well, just to speak and to write. So, but then, uh, the idea of continuing too long in a city did not really excite me. Mm. So I thought, okay, let me take a break from this place. Let me go back and see. Let me spend, I thought initially, I'll spend in Nagaland about five years. <laughs> <laughs> then 2000, uh, uh, the situation happened like uh, when the, the Department of Industries asked me to design a temporary bamboo pavilion mm. for an expo. That time our chief, present chief minister, Sri Nipiwio, he had uh, come to power. Mm. And I, uh, we gave a presentation to the industry department and he also saw that structure and then he invited us to build that structure as a, not a temporary building, but as a semi-permanent building at Kisama. Mm, the famous bamboo pavilion. Yeah, the bamboo pavilion. So this was my first project. Mm. But then it was quite exciting because at that time, that was the largest bamboo structure in the country. Mm. 20,000 square feet of bamboo structure. No one had built. And we just went, architect Jenny Tang assisted me with the structural uh, uh, part, uh, mm. giving us um, the advice and then um, at that time, I got to, to meet our late Sir Norman, who was one of the main mm. Norman Putsari. As with so the Bamboo Resource of, Center. No? Yeah, mm. the main um, mentor also. Right. And that there was the genesis of Bamboo Development Agency. Mm. Mm. Then, uh, in this, uh, th- this was a time also when uh, which gave me a reason to, a stronger reason to stay back. So, this, with this, uh, I was engaged into the uh, Bamboo Development Agency as a co-opted member. Mm. Sir Norman was uh, one exceptional visionary and uh, one of the, uh, also at that time, uh, it, he was such an inspiration. Uh, 
he really push me and my team mm. to like uh, deliver to work to do we would always be uh, like as if we are on the front line running and get, mm. uh, trying to get things done and he was a stickler for perfection everything has to be uh, like really up to the highest standard so it was again good to be in an environment then over the years from there uh, as uh, we uh, there was a competition at uh, all nagaland uh, state competition mm. for capital cultural hope which was recently inaugurated mm. so there i won the first prize so this was again one of uh, you know like sometimes you can be in depression because you don't know anyone and you don't know how things will click and how things will work but then one project led to the another there were two architectural competition so both i won the project the dc complex mokokchum um, and this capital cultural hall so there was some uh, some problem dedication that had happened in between some kind of sm- small small problem uh, with the contractor mm. uh, some issues were there but they sorted it out thankfully and then this time it's inaugurated yeah. and uh, so uh, good to see things that we dream and that we envision being used come to life yeah, also come to mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. and then in this journey uh as i work one of the main patron or mentor was uh, also vilele khamo contractor mm. we just happened to work together on a project and one day i have never met him and i've i've heard a lot about him also but one day i met him and i told him uncle i want to work here for some time but i after this after all my training and activity i want to leave mm. then he said no 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 you should never you should not leave i'll, I'll help you in any way i can no? mm. you should not i said uh, uh, for us to uh, we don't have any contacts or any, we don't know people also but uh, it will be difficult uh, my teams are here but if i can set something up for them for me i don't know like uh, whether it's a long term decision to be here but he t- taught me like in a sense like literally would give me advices would t- tell me uh, would also give me architectural projects wherever he had project he would give me the architectural consultancy mm. help us in a lot of ways when uh, we set up our when we initially came also in general kosal also gave to us one uh, one personal computer mm. you know like your cousin only ato no mm-hmm. both of us came and we just had one computer we didn't even have uh, money no working in bangalore for whatever money you earn you just spend it on your food you earn expenses you don't really mm. save anything Uh, but when we came we didn't have anything uh, two of us just started like that he was my junior he interned with me also he i was his uh, thesis guide also so mm. we, when we started uh, uh engineer kosali gave us a personal PC. computer mm. and gave us a, a video recorder then it was uh, vilele who came in uh, and mentored us uh, my team So uh, he uncle Billy Le in a sense taught us about the technical preparation of technical estimates. Mm. He's very good with numbers. He will know each and every project how much of steel is used to the decimal. Mm. How much is the cost of this? How much is this? Though he keeps saying I've only gone to class 6 mm. but it was he studied only up to class 6 because uh, the school only had up to class 6 <laughs> it's not like he uh, flunked or anything like that but 
at a time and it also there's so many things that we learn from him i personally learn from him is uh, we the younger entrepreneurs maybe i'm jumping into uh, another section but yeah it's okay you can uh, younger entrepreneurs sometimes forget uh, mm-hmm. that the strength of your business is not necessarily just your product it is on how you invest in the network mm-hmm. so i ask him what is the most valuable thing to you in life uncle you know mm. and he said to get to know people to know people to have that network mm. and this is one thing which was important then you should say uh, whatever you do for him he is his goal is to bring two enemies together mm. go, <clears throat> so that they can become friends no mm. now this is something that is lacking in our society today everyone is helping on breaking creating this unity instead of putting effort to bring people together right. so <clears throat> so as i progress like a lot of people starting with sir laluma our chief mm. secretary then our chief secretary he was also like a mentor to me mm. and when i did my first training uh, even 10 days in kohima and 10 days in dimapur with the uh, urban development department sir laluma had come to speak and then he said nagas something about nagaland is that in korea the koreans develop korea the japanese develop japan but for nagas the deshwalis and the mias are developing nagaland mm. so unless nagas themselves develop nagaland nagaland will never develop, develop. because mm. all the money will go out. outside correct now this is something till today it holds true mm. and at that time when we started our training programs and all it was like not many people were there in the construction industry only mm. in the carpentry and stone work so now in rcc a lot of people have come in so that time apart from uh, in the genesis of my work in the sir alam temshi as a plus sir in konglamba we had uh, sir abio who had um, help us a lot sir abio kiran yes yes we have uh, i have sir kiket also who has always believed in us and mm. mentored us then our present chief minister so much of opportunity i got because of him mm. i got a lot of chance to travel abroad to go and study uh, different livelihood even in uh, bali uncle new sale in architecatu he had sent us to go and see how people survive how people study so all this and whenever they get the chance i'm lucky in that sense that's why i said about mentorship mm. they always share with me their personal stories and their personal insights which are very critical valuable also so very, very valuable, valuable right. because we just jump to criticizing people in nagaland without even knowing they're part of the story mm. we uh, have become a society in a sense where we try to search for uh, perfection out of self righteousness mm. all the most perfect people i don't think no one exists because they would be angels they would not be here on earth we are here on earth because we have our own imperfection correct now if we were to as a society if we were to focus on people's imperfection then you will never be able to get uh, anyone in your life uh, to work for you or to be with you but 
if we focus on the strength and if our society spend more time focusing on people's strength then we will thrive mm. and i've seen and work close with most of them and i've seen how their mind works and i've seen how they think and um, like even we do the department madam anongla we had worked uh, close uh, with the eastern nagaland uh, uh, districts working mm. with the programs and all and from department side uh, right now i'm working with agri department i had worked with uh, means i used to work with uh, employment department also on and off whenever i get a chance labor department right. uh, employment department we get to travel to different different uh, districts and see but sometimes our people don't really uh, we we have been so pampered mm. that we don't even see what how much of effort it takes the department to even initiate something to even we just blindly uh, just uh, find something to criticize we mm. just say corruption but i still think lack of work culture is the root of all corruption in societies which are uh, working hard uh, there's there's no time to sit and criticize anything mm. they are all doing their job but if people are sitting idle uh, even if you ask anyone how are you feeling today and uh, the next after that uh, the next discussion will be about criticizing someone it's just uh, uh, it's just something when you're jobless you just uh, feel like uh, i i totally agree with this uh, with you on this it's that uh, very unfortunately right now there's so much negativity mm-hmm. in our society mm-hmm. and that how do we bring more positive you know like uh, a mindset to our people and like you said it's never going to happen with people focusing on the bad or the weaknesses of people like you're saying and just sitting down and talking right uh one thing i i just take away is that you said very humbly but you know you said you had the blessings of so many mentors and all but i don't think that's just by sheer luck i think that uh, a lot of people also saw in you the potential or you know the um that you're doing something right and that's why they want to help you it's not that you know you luckily just got all these mentors i think a lot has to do with who you are and what you what you've done so a lot of people like i said might not know you still or to the extent of what work you do and when you were talking about all these things uh you know the people who know you will know what you're talking about but just for the um the ones that don't know you when you came back from uh, bangalore to naglan you started zynoric yeah, yeah which was basically an architectural firm uh, zynoric consulting yeah uh, yeah mm-hmm. zynoric Con- consultants mm-hmm. and uh, that is that architect- architectural firm and which you do your consultancy in and uh, a few years later you started zynoric initiatives yeah now, this is the one that uh, i i was very interested in and uh, i got my hands on the mm-hmm. uh, you know the sort of what the profile of zynoric initiatives and Uh, I want you to talk a little bit about it. Like you know, there's so many things. If we talk about it, mm. it'll go on for hours, yeah, yeah. which I would love to. But then you know, mm. um, but like some things that just stick out to me are like you know the amount of training on different, um, uh, so many different aspects of livelihoods and like you know and how uh, far uh, flung you've gone across the state. Mm. Uh, the one number that stuck out to me was like you know, was it? Uh, I don't want to get this. wrong so but 6000 naga youths have directly benefited mm, mm. and si- around 600 have been trained and are currently employed under zynoric initiatives and you know the work that you do so that that kind of number is for me quite mind blowing i think a lot of people will be also shocked to you know hear hear those numbers um and then we'll talk about one or two in particular but mm. when you talk about zynoric initiatives uh, like a few things that i just want to know is um how did it start like what was your purpose or the drive behind you know wanting to start zynoric initiatives when you just started your consultancy firm and also uh, what are some of like the key projects because you dabble in everything right mm. what are some of the key projects that are close to you with uh, zynoric initiatives mm. so zynoric initiative we started 2003 though we got it registered only in 2009 Mm. was at the insistence of uh, sir abio uh, who he told us that you should get yourself uh, your paperwork registered so we can fund 
uh, your capacity building. Mm. So, when we started our activity, apart from one or two, this thing, uh, most of the activity we used to fund on our own, mm. whatever saving we had from our consultancy. Mm. The, the thing is like this. If you see in Nagaland, we do a lot of felicitations for successful people. Mm. And there's a lot of uh, uh, events conducted for the toppers and for a lot of uh, right. the military students. But the failures, the dropouts are the ones stuck with us. Mm. And we don't do anything for them and we just keep condemning them. Mm. From starting from family, you know, we start saying that ah, my son will not be able to do anything. He's not been able to pass. He's not. Uh, he's dull or whatnot. The dropouts and the one, I. So focus my energy on. Working for those people, training, not to send people outside, mm. but to train them so they can get, self employment, wherever they are. Mm. My activity has always been uh, in as much as possible to train people to wherever they are and then to also train them in such a way that uh, they will be able to do something with their life and not live in a life of uh, self-condemnation. Mm. When you talk about numbers, you know, like every training program will have... Uh, Statewide, uh, we would handle 600, uh, 100 for uh, one district, 550 for one district. Mm. The numbers can go even higher also. Mm. But the numbers was irrelevant, you know. Because for every 20 to 25 candidates we train, or uh, in a batch, sometimes the bigger batches would be about 60. Hardly 10 or 15 of them stick to that thing for a longer period of time. Right. Because for Nagas, we are seasonal, you know. There's nothing a Naga would do like full time. Uh, when uh, they would be engaged in construction industry for some time, and then they'll be they'll go back to farming. Mm -hmm. And some of them will end up as a taxi driver again for some time, mm -hmm. and then come back to some uh, business, and then they keep shifting. But the thing was, so initially, uh, uh, we understood that, okay, uh, we have to change our methodology. And we kept changing our methodology. Till date, our methodology kept changing. Mm. Now, our success ratio has gone up high, very high, because uh, we are uh, in the process of selection. We've been telling them, don't come for the training just because you are sitting idle. If you want to do something with your life and you want to uh, train in one particular area, come to us, then we'll train you. So then the serious people came. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and over the years, government have been helping a lot. But, you know, like, sometimes, though, we even found, like, syndicates who came for training. <laughs> there are people who organize a uh, group <laughs> who distribute candidates here, there, and then uh, they'll give their attendance and uh, whatever freebies you give, now they'll collect it. So, uh, so with Zyneric Initiative, uh, the idea was to uh, create a kind of a work culture, see in what way we can uh, excel. And as far as for me, when I see when I meet a lot of these dropouts, so much of potential, and we are not slow. So they say, uh, "You're weak in Hindi, na." Uh, then you you cannot complete your education. Imagine you're weak in mathematics, and and that those people are actually not weak weak in mathematics also. But it is just that we used to have problem with concentration because sometimes school classroom environment can be very slow, you know. Mm. Uh, smart people can uh, not thrive inside a classroom, regular classroom right. environment. It's not, the mm. processing speed is fast and the way teachers teach can be very slow. That and yeah. So, uh, I found uh, these people to be 
very uh, uh, such a potential uh, workforce mm. very creative and when we started training them uh, there was also something that we didn't expect but uh, one major challenge that we faced at that mm. time when we are training with the Zainurik initiative uh, these activities is the lack of discipline mm. the moment you create economic opportunity for people right the moment you teach them a new skill and now they can earn money no? immediately they don't know how to spend that money it'll be like uh, drinks and it'll be you know, <laughs> uh, getting into that uh, the peer pressure mm, mm. then uh, they always have uh, some kind of an event coming up mm. and uh, the closer to you are to the town or the bigger town the more that ex- expenses <laughs> yeah so uh, we at Zainari we did that uh, we kept training until today we are also conducting trainings uh, as much as possible in one way or the other, uh, it is uh, having its own success story. Because in Mon, there are more than 31 local contractors now mm. in RCC. Thikadar, no? Before, our people used to work under non-local as uh, Jugalis, mm. as uh, side mystery. But now they have their own, they are able to capture project on their own. In Longleng also, that uh, uh, it has happened. Chamato also, it has happened. Kipiri also. So... Uh, uh, now our locals are able to understand that construction sector is a big sector. Mm. What is very important for any society is that money should circulate Within. between the local people. Mm. And a lot of money is being pumped by government of India through our state funds also into construction sector. If our people had work and uh, in those projects, then all the money would have been retained by us. Right. But because we don't work, because we are voluntarily unemployed, and we don't uh, think uh, these are these menial jobs are like good uh, enough for us. Uh, no? Good enough mm. for us. They don't understand that these jobs in the construction sector each day. I'm just talking about average, and mm. it will be higher. I'm, a mystery, uh, a tikada can earn about six thousand rupees per day. Mm. By just uh, distributing workforce around, they don't work. They just uh, manage. Sort of manage. Yeah. Mm. And our locals are now understanding that we can really have a very sustainable uh, income in this construction sector mm. because one thing that makes uh, uh, local more uh, disadvantages is. The way our at- attitude and temperament is, mm. we we don't understand how this thing works. No? Right. So in Zainurik, what uh, our initiative activity we uh, for one side I do this bamboo construction that mm. attracts architects and students from all over India mm. to, come to work uh, and intern with us in our bamboo activities. Then for within the state to you know, partner with di- different different departments, we closely work with them, and then uh, we try to uh, make sure that we travel to all the places. See, uh, some sometimes people comment and ask me, why do you have to uh, earn so much of money? And uh, they assume that me going to Eastern Nagaland and all this is for earning a lot of money. See, we don't earn, we don't do this thing for earning money. Mm. My thing is, every Naga has to put themselves in this situation where you say, if I don't go, who will go? And when I go to any of these, uh, any of the districts, I tell them, see, I am coming here because I consider myself as a Naga, not as any tribe. Mm. And you are my brothers and sisters and I'm coming there to share whatever I've learned outside and I'm coming here to your village and sometimes I even threaten my friends who are sitting uh, uh, in Dimapur and Kohima and don't go to their villages there mm-hmm. I said I'll go and tell the village chairman uh, to cut your name okay I'm coming to your village more often than you're not going <laughs> so the younger generation have to know that 
all the people on social media are not necessarily the whole uh, population of our Nagaland. Naga, of Nagaland. There's so many people who are still struggling. There's so many people who are going through bad times also. Right. But our five minutes of time also will make a, such a lot of difference. There's so many things that uh, uh, if you have tried a business and if you have learned the right way, your two, three minutes of input can make a lot of difference to people who are just starting, mm. who without knowing will waste all their money. Mm. But if we, have, uh, if we go there and guide them, then sometimes they... At least if one person get uh, the right information, then the rest can also benefit. Right. So, our, uh, with Zainorik, this is our activity. Now, uh, with, uh, we have started Sitogi Living School with that. Mm. And then um, we are uh, doing, right now, bamboo handicraft training. My end thing is, uh, we will focus on two, three sectors. One is uh, bamboo will always be there mm. as construction. One is I'm really keen on the, the increasing the blacksmith potential. Uh, okay. Blacksmith, because uh, for the boys, uh, blacksmith is something that is naturally, we love it as a hobby. We just, just that we don't have that required knowledge. And um, agricultural tools and implements can be handcrafted mm. in india there's no good handcrafted agricultural uh, implement this time one of my uh, kind of a mentor antipui received a gift from japan one handcrafted signature and mm. that was very good quality and these are very good gardening tools can be made from nagaland and there's a lot of potential mm. Uh, here for the boys and for the girls, I think pottery is something we've, which we have ignored. Mm. Uh, though it was also a tradition craft, and with our creativity, we can do very good quality flower pots also, and uh, and 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 a lot of the ceramic items. Mm. So in the next uh, coming years, we'll be focusing on that um, for uh, for the young. Uh, we also have. Uh, uh, green under green care uh, under generic initiative we have the green green caravan right so we are focusing on the progressive upcoming farmers mm. uh, i'll talk in detail on that uh, the green caravan initiative. Yeah. yeah 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 exactly i was just coming to that because there's so many things that you know uh, i feel like it's a loss that we can't talk about all of them in detail but because of time constraints you know but you have touched on quite a few like you went through quite fast with a few, but the green caravan is one that I wanted to discuss with you and how that came about. So basically, uh, for those that don't know, mm. if you could just uh, describe it first, what it is, like what's the service that it provides or what, you know, the market linkage and all that and uh, what it is currently doing right now and what it you plan to achieve to do with it. So green caravan, uh, by definition, it is an organic training, logistic, Marketing, one of the ventures and initiatives by mm. us. My venture into farming started uh, with a dream. Uh, actual dream where mm. I saw two ladies, old ladies who told me that uh, they look like nuns, they look like, I don't know, like what uh, they said six months you have to teach people to store and eat food eh? for mm. six months maybe for maybe in the future we might be facing some climate catastrophe catastrophe mm. i don't know like before that i was never into farming or anything mm. i just ignored that dream but kept it in mind and then but then by 2007 things started actually uh Opportunity started opening up for me to do try get into farming to mm -hmm. get into farming and by 2009 we really started farming hardcore mm. and like a typical average naga full josh we went into farming uh, we went online and searched all the best material and we tried all the technique and uh, when we 
developed the whole farm from the next year itself because the land had become uh, had improved mm. it became so expensive to wrestle with the weeds to wrestle uh, uh, with the t- wild uh, seeds, the trees have started coming out. Mm. So clearing it itself became um, a big problem. And when we planted a lot of uh, uh, f- uh, vegetables, even harvesting it was more tiring than planting. You know, nobody wanted to harvest it. No, and then uh, it was like um, it was for social media. It was good enough, mm-hmm. uh, but. Uh, but when it came to the actual, actual yeah. discipline of farming, you know, mm-hmm. it was uh, kind of a shocker. Then I realized that farming, the first year, for one year, the farming can be easy. But then the moment you start uh, continuing it, it became tougher and tougher because we did not understand a lot of things. Mm. So this was like, uh, these setbacks pushed me to like, not quit, but to understand the whole uh, challenges. And so then I realized and I understood the role of pH, uh, what pH level plays, how soil structure has to be, how the roots work, what is uh, mycorrhiza, what is uh, trichoderma, what um, the role of humic acid, we started uh, understanding how root uh, uh, function uh, under the ground. What are the role of the macro and micronutrient? I had to go very deep into the science. Mm. And then I, my own uh, first cousin is also a graduate from Sassar. We would end up uh, sitting and discussing and we did some trial um, farming together. Mm. And I understood that the Farming situation in Nagaland, we were uh, subsistence subsistence farmer. Okay. We just grew enough for this year because we have so much of land, we don't have to grow extra. No? Mm. It all lead to wastage. So we just grew the only so much that we That what eat. we need. Yeah. yeah. And we didn't, there was no market structure. So mm. we didn't really have to sell. And actually we were living in a kind of a garden of Eden. If you really think about it, if had not that pressure of uh, selling products and all this thing came in, we still could have uh, survived and thrived by just relying on the jungle. Mm. Because we most of the greens that we eat are foraged from the wild. But why there's so much of deforestation is also our modern generation attempt at farming mm. and then we give up. We say, oh, let's, let's clear the jungle and then let's do some farming and then we give up. So somewhere uh, people have to learn this, uh, the right process mm. and understand the science. So I was also thinking why uh, Sasar, now they've, they've uh, renamed it as SAS, University is there, Central Institute of Horticulture is there, with all these uh, big universities here, why we don't have successful agripreneurs, entrepreneurs mm. in there. So, with all our uh, agricultural university and um, even ICAR research and everything, the reason I soon realized is the ecosystem was not there for an agri entrepreneur. Mm. It is uh, very expensive to start in a live farm Mm. unless you have a running capital initially because by the time the products start coming in, by the time the revenue start coming in, before that point, you might run out of money. Mm. Even with uh, the same thing happened with livestock farming. And I studied the feeds and just one pig alone. If you don't design the pig feed properly, the trow, the, the daba in which you feed, feed the yeah. mm. it can lead to a wastage of half bag of pig feed. 
So if a pig feed is about 2,200 at present rate, you are still you are losing every month 1,200 yeah. mm-hmm. just by wastage. So everything required very careful planning. And then I, uh, I have noticed, and this is what is happening all over the world. Right now, environmentalists are uh, going head to head with the farmers. Mm. And, you know, like uh, today, people will say, but this is politicized and all this thing. You know, like in Europe, there's a farmer blocking the road and everything. Why all these things happening around the world is because, see, farming is a very sensitive uh, activity. Mm. You cannot start commercial farming unless you understand how to manage water resource properly. Most of this country in South America, even in America, they just relied on the subterranean borewell water system. Mm. And they you depleted everything. And now the country is turning into desert. And now environmentalists are trying to change that and now they're going head to head with the farmers. See, even in Nagaland, this whole issue will happen if we don't understand how to create the right ecosystem and how to make this activity sustainable. So with my experience in uh, the farming uh, activity, I got in uh, a couple of um, BSc degree, MSc also. I got them to work with me. And in between, uh, when uh, Sir Keketo was uh, the APC Agricultural Production Commissioner. He came and visited my farm and then he said, see Richard, um, there's so many agricultural graduates just sitting idle, just preparing for a government exam. Mm. So I'll uh, let Green Caravan be the service provider. You engage them and then uh, uh, get them to work uh, along with you and then uh, go and uh, target our farmers. Mm -hmm. So that's how we became now, this is one of our current activity. We became the service provider for uh, government of Nagaland, our uh, agri department, also horti department, two FPCs. In this, uh, we also, one of the other side was that when we talk about a lot of uh, training and a lot of activities developing the farming sector. Our farmers are still uh, continuously, they're plagued with this problem that there's no one to buy their product Mm. or they're not getting a good price or uh, they feel that they've been cheated. Mm. So, What is it uh, that, uh, what is the real problem of that? So this was in around uh, 2015-16. We, up to just uh, prior to uh, the COVID, we opened outlets in uh, Guwahati, Zuti, uh, Zuro, Mm. in Ali. We also opened Uraki in uh, uh, in Delhi, uh, in Guwahati, we call it Nagaki, made in Nagaland. So we took in as much as Naga product to see what sells in uh, mm. Guwahati. In between, also we uh, started trying to sell our local product to just to uh, market our local product to see what was the demand. Mm. What was the how did it fare as a competition to other items? What was the... So we saw those, those challenges. And in, uh, um, in between, uh, I have opened the chapu, no? the, the yeah, yeah. roadside. The whole intention of opening <clears throat> up that is to... Whenever I traveled, I saw a lot of people 
just trying to do something and sell some small items so that they can pay their children's school fees. Mm. So I have opened that shop route to be able to sell these items to connect with those uh, villagers and different different uh, places so they can have an outlet to sell. Mm. To that department also uh, later came to know these and then they we tied up and then we set up Anya so that right. um, Anya mm. could uh, sell these products. And in between with this uh, farming and uh, uh, with this activity, the market linkage uh, also became one as part of the ecosystem, a very mm. important uh, ecosystem. So then I realized like, uh, if we had, so if someone had a corpus fund, like ready cash, about 10 crore available and sitting in Dimapur, and if you just say, okay, you bring to this quality, we'll buy it and we'll give you straight cash. Mm. If the trust was developed, our farmers would really start farming. But over the years, they've been cheated. Someone would mm. uh, ask them to farm about this much and then later that guy will disappear. And mm -hmm. uh, So all this, um, to all the district I went, I heard this problem. Some people would say, if you're coming for government program, don't come and discuss with us. Like that, they, they would say. No? I said, no, I'm here to listen to you. So let us uh, discuss and let's see. So now we are understanding that, okay, this is one side of the problem. The other side is, our items are too expensive. So what is happening is, in Kohima in Dimapur, mm -hmm. even the potatoes, I recently found that it's coming from Meghalaya only. So if Meghalaya farmers are able to sell their potatoes, chili, and tomato to Kohima, supply to Kohima, what happened to our farmers now? What, where are all, all those success stories? Mm, mm. If they are not able to even supply to our own local market, what are all those... Uh, Sometimes uh, we see in the news the success stories of a lot of these, uh, our farmers and all. Our market, local market itself is so big. Kohima consumes about every day 110 pigs. So imagine if you were rearing 100 pigs, it is even less than what you a Kohima consume for one day. So you're, you'll not even be able to supply to Kohima, mm. even if you rear 100 pigs. So, and uh, you won't believe it, but even fish, no. Every day, about 8,000 kgs is sold in Kohima. Mm. If you were to sell 100 kg of, of big, uh, fish from your fishery, you will not know where to sell in Kohima 100 kg. You will think that's too high of a quantity. But mm. 8,000 kilos of uh, fish being sold. Our local market itself for consumption is big enough. And this is why, like, with Green Caravan, I... Uh, to the farmers also, I tell them, see, let's not start with a fancy idea of marketing. I want to sell this. First, make sure that your farming technique is good enough that you can grow what you buy. Mm. Let's say, let's target number one with, let's say that we are such good farmers that we stop buying anything that we eat. No? We started growing on our own. The next level is you grow surplus and you sell the surplus only. If you are not able to grow what you are eating, the basic thing, then we cannot say you are a good farmer. Mm. Let's not assume, let's not say growing arekanat, double gas, uh, growing all these things are farmer activity. These are lazy people's activity. If you have got a uh, 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 land that you cannot tend to grow arekanat, but as an active farmer, Mm. As a progressive farmer, you should not uh, just think that growing those is enough. The other thing is, if you want to be a progressive farmer, you have to make sure that you are growing not just... You cannot say, I'm a ginger farmer. What, what do you do for the rest of the time? No. Mm. Are you really running up and down your ginger farm every day? You have to make sure that uh, your farm is integrated and you are, uh, it's bringing in a lot of uh, uh, money from different, different sources. Yeah, yeah. so this, 
the training and also uh, the main thing has always been water management how to rely only on the uh, like your ring well maximum how to develop uh, uh, not ever rely on bore well for your farming how to start conserving water and how to nowadays i'm trying to teach our people how to do self irrigating fields no? mm. using gravity by not really having to irrigate everywhere you see progressive farmers will have a drip irrigation and all this activity but if you design your uh, layout properly if you march it properly they call it um, it is a, a broad term for that, for that it's known as syntropic agroforestry mm. but uh, syntropic agroforestry uh, it started becoming more prominent after uh, the uh, amazon forest is getting destroyed mm. it's getting destroyed even at a faster pace but now people are trying to uh, revert that condition mm. by uh, uh, coming to the syntropic agroforestry but the most ideal environment is uh, using satoyama principle so okay. satoyama principle is uh, it's a universally accepted principle now it, uh, from the satoyama region of Japan where the higher forests are left untouched mm. it's kept in pristine condition and the forest comes down to the fields and then it drains into a lake and all the fertilizer that is required comes naturally from the forest only so you don't have to like rely on any artificial uh, fertilizer mm. what we have done is we have destroyed most of our forests so our water source is gone the upper region so we if we start slowly uh, if we uh, push ourselves to understanding this system it is very easy for us in nagaland to again because we are not late at all we are just at the right time when we can recollect all these things mm. we have to understand something that nagaland is blessed in every way people are smart enough sharp enough creative enough skillful enough they just need the right uh, training they just need the right uh, their, uh, guidance, guidance mentorship okay. and the land that we are in from brahmaputra up to the Sara, up to saramati that portion is a very young patch of land this if you research this region are known as vavilov region where new species originate if you see then nah, you will be as, uh, surprised like we have kiwi in the wild mm. see kiwi people associate kiwi with uh, new zealand right but it was never indigenous of new zealand one school teacher took the, the kiwi you know, from china to new zealand and that's how they uh, propagated it they did a little bit of biogenetic engineering and the um, the golden kiwi that they have is a result of all those things mm. naturally it is not there so uh be it asparagus be it strawberry everything is there in the wild and in the wild it will be it will not be sweet it will be in this natural uh, setting they just um, by uh, taking the uh, right seed and planting again and again they can uh, uh, create that condition so with bamboo also we have more than 46 species of bamboo and 28 are endemic to our region mm. and there are places in india who wants to be like uh, known as the bamboo capital and they hardly have four species of bamboo five species of bamboo whereas we still have not found the strength and the right use for all of our bamboos also mm. so this land that we are in has got so much of potential for the younger generation but and then there are so many species of plants and even insects and maybe birds we still would not have 
uh, which still would be rare, but we have, uh, we are like blindly ignoring it and we are uh, blindly destroying it. So it is the green caravan is like on one end we are doing that MOVCD NER. This is mission on organic value chain development for Northeast region. Okay. This is organic certification uh, for the farmers. To certify organic means they have to follow certain protocol to bring back our land to an organic state. Though by we are by default organic, mm. uh, we don't have the certification. So without the certification, we will not get the good. Uh, will not get good price. As as uh, people move into uh, more uh, into promotion of our items, like an organic ginger, maybe what we sell uh, at 20 rupees per kg, you will be able to sell at 100 rupees, uh, mm. 140 rupees per kg. Simply start. by the tag of that organic. Yeah, but, mm. but uh, it's not just, the system is not like uh, you buy a certificate and then you say it's organic. Right, right. Uh, the system is... Uh, it's more detailed than that. Of course. Uh, mm. The farmer has to upload uh, on regular basis. So that's why we need progressive farmers mm. uh, onto the portal. Like today I'm starting, I've cleared this land and I'm going to uh, plant this much. And this is like that. No? Mm. The, the, the system will track it. Mm. And then in the end, you say, okay, this is the uh, ginger. Um, the history of this ginger, mm. the whole farming and the whole sequence will be there. And then when the buyer scans uh, that product, they, they can just uh, see the activity also. At the same time, uh, uh, if, if something, if they test the uh, product and then find that there's something which is non-organic, then the whole company will be blacklisted. Mm. So we are working with the department to make sure that uh, the products and all this thing is reaching uh, uh, the mainland, mm. uh, mainland India. So a lot of companies are coming in, like uh, uh, that one. Uh, the, the now it's uh, uh, Godrej and different different companies. Uh, even Amul also came some time back. So they are trying to reach out. Uh, they see Nagaland also as a huge potential. Okay. The in the northeast, like if you see. Uh, uh, for organic farming, those Sikkim is declared as an organic right, state. Right. They don't have that much of land mass like us. So we are in the best position. So this is where our young, uh, we see that uh, this has potential. And so we are pushing with our Green Caravan Initiative. And in with that also our government, also, I mean the departments also, we are all working mm. hand in hand here. That's a, uh, I mean, and I think the name is very apt also. The Green Caravan, it's going around and trying to revitalize the, the market also, also the environment. And when you were talking about all these things, because you went pretty in-depth, and also uh, when you were talking about earlier about the uh, construction workforce and this, there were some points that I wanted to discuss with you, right? Uh, that is... Of course, related to your line of work, but not exactly your career. So this is, uh, we'll, we'll go through them one by one. But uh, you touched on one thing was that um, the employment, uh, you know, unemployment uh, problem that we're facing in Nagaland and also the uh, sustainability for that, right? That's one. Then, uh, because you touched on that with the labor workforce and how you are trying to do that with uh, Zainarak initiatives and train people so that they can start. Uh, sustainable economy, sorry. Yeah. And uh, I'll just list all three and then we can slowly mm. go into each. Mm. And uh, basically two. So, yeah, unemployment and the sustainable uh, economy. Mm. And second is something that I think you're very passionate about, which is the environment, right? Mm. And... Uh, under that comes, like you, you were touching on it a little bit when you talked about with the green caravan, about how the detrimental mm -hmm. effects that it's having on our, maybe the future for our children and their children, right? So we'll get into that. But why don't we start with uh, unemployment? Mm -hmm. And uh, like we can just sort of phrase the conversation like this where you just give your opinion on it, yeah. but also 
what are the biggest sort of like the stumbling blocks the hurdles that we're facing is it self uh, you know created what is the is it the environment that we're in or what is it and maybe what how do you see us getting out of this uh, problem see uh, sometimes i feel sorry for the younger generation now that they seem to be blamed for everything sometimes no mm. now let us see the situation that we grew up in today uh, our parents were more successful because they grew up in a struggling environment and but they made our life comfortable so we are not ne- no uh, we are no longer in a struggling environment and we have become more relaxed and to go to the farm they used to walk mm. and but for us we have to go by our by vehicle now the cost of the vehicle also comes into our farming activity so we ourselves means i would be one generation up and um, the younger generation would be one generation lower than me but i would blindly go and say score them for this thing for that thing give them all uh, advice and all but sometimes when i sit and think i know this situation is created not by them they are not at fault it is created by us because we wanted to give them a good life but that good life did not train them uh, for the world that they are experiencing right now so our own parents kept telling us study hard otherwise you will become a, uh, you will not become an officer if you don't study hard you become a servant no? but then had we been trained as a servant we would have been more comfortable now mm. than uh, being trained as an officer and not getting an and officer job yeah yeah so one person only one person can become the prime minister of india only one person can become the chief minister of nagaland and if everybody aspires to become that then we'll be left with a lot of uh, unsuccessful people uh, in uh, in our state so i keep telling people that government job is not created for to create uh, is not for creating employment for our people government job is only to employ those people who can run the government activity and run the government services unless there is strong private economy uh, government salary cannot be paid the private economy has to pay the government uh, salary mm. nagaland government should not look at government of india to pay the government salary the private people have to work here so that government salary can be paid so when you see in mainland india the government servant do not take care of their family the private people are more successful so they take care of the government servant mm-hmm. but in nagaland if one person gets a government job he has to take care of the entire family plus the whole village plus the church plus everything so we are right now stuck with an issue when we say unemployment what do you uh, where and how do you consider yourself employed because in nagaland unless you are uh, uh, you have a valid government job all of us will be labeled as unemployed mm. unless uh, the, uh, so and there's also a, a misconception that my father is poor means how do you say my father is a farmer mm. actually in first world countries farmers are rich in third world countries farmers are poor means third world and first world world countries were coined during uh, the cold war but now we have come to associate third world countries as poor, poor countries yeah. mm-hmm. so the mindset of our people also have to change we have to give them an environment and we have to also sensitize them on certain things one is when you look at our aspiring entrepreneurs and our young business people we want to search for funds and start a business mm. that you want to do right 
but we do that without experience. Mm. Whereas a non-local has already been in that business for 10 years working under someone. Now he, he has learned how to manage it properly and he saves money and he or she starts that business with the experience that they have gained. Mm. Because they cannot afford to fail. lose, mm. afford mm. to fail. So they gain the, 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 the business, uh, the experience of that business. For us, we are like, if I get the money, I'll get the human resource who will manage. I'll just be the main manager out there and uh, try to manage with no experience. So our money is going, uh, is burning right in front of our eyes mm. because we don't have the experience. So then let's talk about ecosystem. How is it that a non-local guy with no education, if you check any of them and see, Okay, can you compete with me uh, in general knowledge or anything? Huh? Nowhere they be, will be able to come near us because we are so highly qualified and highly educated. But why are, are they thriving in business and we are not? It's because they have an ecosystem. Like uh, in the construction industry, let me just illustrate. There's so much of uh, non-local construction workers mm. but they are able to quote I have 180 rupees square feet 200 square feet how are they able to mentally calculate that when they don't have any idea of what square feet is also mm. but they they have one guy in between who tells them inaga kobi Inaga kobi. That guy does all the billing for them. And then he takes a commission. Mm. They have an ecosystem. They have a system where inner line permit and all these things, someone will run for them. They have a system where uh, they take loan from a certain, uh, uh, from within themselves and they can start business right away. For us, we don't, for Nagas, we don't know how to create our own ecosystem. And we will, we don't even like going to our own friend's uh, car shop because they'll not take money, you know? We don't have that business sense. If you go to our friend shop, they'll say, ah, me, I see, uh, then you don't want to go to treat them because every time he's again, uh, he or she is again put to that. And then even if we have a complaint, you don't want to say anything because um, they are our friends. So sometimes, and if you say something also, they'll take it so sensitive. Everyone, nobody has complained so far and you're the only person who has complained. And maybe Chao, uh, maybe you're used to, uh, uh, you're very negative like that. And so the thing is, we don't know, uh, we, genetically also, we were not in a, 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 a business kind business. of environment. So we also don't know how to create this ecosystem. I think one of the biggest takeaways because i've uh, heard this in the past also and it's something that's very striking about how we're losing so much money our state our people because i don't know what the numbers would be but i'm assuming at least 90 plus percent of the entire construction workforce is non-local right so money is circulating not within our economy but going out and uh, how possible is it to sort of recapture that market and make that our own because not it's not like we're saying it's not just that we're creating jobs for our youth to get into the construction sector it's not just that but the fact that money will be circulating within our economy and boosting our economy how how is it like too far fetched the dream how long is it away if it is possible you know this is um, it's very much possible it's not even about displacing people right <clears throat> it's not even about kicking out people mm. it is just us putting ourselves to doing better job than other people and uh, it is an issue of you know like uh, temperament also and mm. attitude both even aptitude mm. sometimes uh, we don't have the patience to get the right skill. You know, 
people, non-locals, don't become skillful by going for training, but they become skillful by working for years and years under good people. For us, we don't have the patience to do that. Mm. We are always looking for easy money only means. That has not been the case before, but uh, these days, everybody, uh, there's period pressure to become quick, rich quick. Quick, yes. In order to earn well in construction sector, it's very simple. Your work has to be good. The quality of your work, if it is good, people are willing to pay. Mm. But when you engage <clears throat> our local people, sometimes we end up doing shabby job. Mm. Mm. And we put a lot of pressure onto our uh, uh, owner, house owners, clients. The employer is. We put pressure on them, asking them to pay us more because we are locals. Mm. Then we, uh, the client will start thinking like, why just because they are local, why should they expect more? Mm. See, there was a time when we talk about dignity of labor. Right. And our people used to go and sell newspapers. Mm. When the non-local sell newspaper for two rupees, our uh, local will say sell for five rupees, saying that we are local. No. Mm. There is no dignity of labor. Dignity of labor is being able to work at par with anyone. Right. And uh, without complaining. Mm. And this misuse of this whole support local campaign that yeah. is a genuine cause also. Yeah, yeah mm. because people have the right to uh, uh, the, uh, complain because the moment you say local, then everybody knows that it's going to be very expensive. Exactly. And we are like, uh, sometimes we know about all the other problem of every other tribe, every other community, but we don't even understand what is our own personal problem. So, mm. Sometimes we have to address this. So we have to become employable. Employability is a big issue. Mm. Sincerity, uh, when it works, the work ethic, uh, being able to, having the right temperament. In construction industry, we should be able to coordinate and uh, work well with others. So in that, uh, in this uh, construction industry, because it's very demanding also. Right. Physically, it's very demanding. You have to be able to adjust to any condition. So that kind of, uh, if we have the right temperament, then it's very easy for us to mm. uh, 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 try. But the other thing is, see, non-locals try because they have, like I mentioned, they have ecosystem. That means if a project comes also, if they cannot handle it also, they'll still give it to their own uh, group. Mm. They'll bring in another mystery. And the contractor will say, I'm doing this, but he'll bring in another person. So they are all connected and they make sure that they capture everything. Mm. For us though, we don't even... Um, the next Naga worker is always our competition. Mm. We always look at each other as like competitors instead of collaborators. Mm. So when we see each other... Uh, that is like a raw, untrained um, uh, situation. So, if unless we learn how to work together in a construction industry, we'll be losing the job. And then, uh, because we in that sector, we are not able to uh, really uh, coordinate well, we end up, we uh, sleep mm. You know, suddenly we'll keep the um, client waiting for months. So we half done work mm. and our clients don't want to come back to the uh, local workers. So if we address these issues and if we understand these things, then we'll be able to make mm. sure that money circulation <clears throat> happens between us. And if we learn to promote each other. Mm. Support one another. Mm. I think uh, that's, you know, it's unfortunate, but this our, my show is all about being positive and, you know, trying to... Uh, make that catch on with others but when when you need to call a spade a spade you have to right and about how nagas and i've heard this time and time again that uh, not to generalize too much but when it comes to employability mm -hmm. is that we are you know lagging behind very far whether it be work discipline whether it be work ethics um and at uh, when your skill level like you were just saying your skill level will be here but 
your demand or your asking salary or you know what you want would be up here so it's not you know matching and and like you said again i don't think this uh, it sort of uh, not entirely falls on the the generation of today but like you said how we have been sort of too spoiled maybe from hard working farmers to you know it's slowly the easy life has come and, and um, about that where that work culture is also not uh, what it used to be in in our maybe our genes also nowadays right so hopefully we can get there not to be too pessimistic but you know there are some things that we should address so maybe a little self reflection is also required you know at times and uh, tied into all this was what you mentioned earlier about the environment mm. when you're talking about uh, the green caravan i think uh, this is something that you personally are very passionate about right mm. the environment and uh, it it's it's a very big topic when you just say environment and i mean in regards to nagaland uh, a few things i want to touch on when it comes to this is um because we see in the papers and the other day we were talking about what what are some of the topics we'd like to uh, just discuss and all and then the next day i saw the article in nagaland post i think it was that somewhere in tuli uh illegal coal mining leading to yeah, yeah. you know all that so it's it's real it's happening you know we've seen it all over nagaland whether it's uh, stone quarrying coal mining this and that what is first of all what is like you know the ground reality of how the dangerous space that we're going in and and disrupting our our environment for uh, maybe not even our grandchildren's time you know our children's time that's one second is uh, your take on you know how the importance of you know to preserve why why is it so important to preserve our environment and uh, and then obviously that will lead into the balance between you know economic development and also uh sustaining our um environment so the balance between that because uh see the main uh concern about environment is because again like i said we are a very young geological formation mm. even if you see the construction work that is going in between kohima and dimapur it is not entirely the contractors that fall mm. they are dealing with very unstable geological condition and we have to be very sensitive about this i do not support the coal mines and what not it's because our grid that is pushing mm. us to do it there's no other uh, justification for that i've been to those areas and i've seen how the rivers and the water bodies are being damaged and how permanent damage are being done just for some few people to earn money when there's so many other ventures i've told them also see for the same amount of coal that you earn after deducting everything they mm. earn about uh, maybe 80000 to 1 lakh or 1.5 after deducting everything mm. for that same amount you can of broom broom grass mm. you can earn about uh, more than 2 lakhs for broom so broom is uh, has less risk and it has got more money then you uh, digging up that coal and leaving permanent damage mm. the young generation whatever they are facing today and we are scolding them for a lot of things it's our fault because we have not done anything to ensure we have not gone the extra mile mm. to ensure that there is economic um, there is uh, economic potential for them in this sector or this employment uh, we have not created any avenues for them and we have just thrown our resources to them and then say like okay well, you can do coal mining or you can do stone quarrying or you can do extensive uh, this thing we are not uh, at what what level of education do we need for us to say that okay we should not do this as it will damage our environment 
Mm. If you see um, in Europe, all the roads and all are very narrow, but they are so uh, uh, hesitant on developing further out of fear of damaging the environment, which is irreversible. Mm. There is a time when we have to understand that you inheriting an apartment, huge apartment complex from your grandfather has no value. Mm. But you inheriting a well-developed farm or something or a forest or a, no, no, has got more value for you. Otherwise, that building and those developed asset in three gener generations that will become defunct. It's of God. Um, and today, there is something like I want to link this environmental thing with um, employ unemployment and uh, sustainability also mm. because the damage to our environment is being also being triggered by employment opportunities and economic opportunities. Mm. It is a mentality of poverty that makes us think that we need to earn so much to be successful. Mm. Like we have set this criteria that you have to build a house, you have to buy this vehicle, you have uh, you have to f there's a checklist and you have to achieve this much and then you will be successful. This kind of Poverty, mentality of poverty has gone to all our Naga villages mm. in our towns. And this came in when is because this came in during when statehood was formed. When people started getting salary, they realized that you can just buy with one month salary more than one year of uh, rice that you can uh, grow. Mm. So people started thinking what's the point in going to the field every day when you can just buy with this currency mm. everything. So it became uh, the, the deciding factor between poor and rich who had cash in hand were rich who didn't have cash were poor. So then anyone who didn't have that cash uh, were poor and it, this became a yardstick for measurement mm. and this became our mentality of poverty. Right. Now, everyone is uh, directly or indirectly now. We, have, we are worshipping money now. Mm. And uh, there, this is a this is a marker for what you have and what you don't have. And if we, it is this marker that is, uh, that has made us insensitive to our own environment. Mm. There is no collective sense of responsibility or sense of ownership to protecting our environment. You know, like. Uh, uh, it will touch on a little bit on tribalism also. We are all small tribes. But today, they, before there were no problem in a sense like uh, we were all stuck on our own, in our own villages and all. But as we became a government, as a state, and we didn't want to work and we be, wanted, became greedy, we started using this tribalism as an agenda to fight against each other tribe. And we just you started using this as a kind of an excuse uh, to create issues. But if you see whether you are, which, whichever tribe you are, the future of each and every tribe is connected only by the environment that we live in. If I destroy my environment, the next tribe next to it also will get destroyed. Mm -hmm. Everyone will uh, suffer. In Delhi, uh, because of this burning of this rice and all this in Haryana and all uh, Punjab, they are suffering, they are having uh, permanent uh, damage in, in the environment. 
So human beings share the natural resources. If people work hard together and if we work for one another, if I as an Angami go and work hard in, a, uh, in one district and work hard for the people, all the other tribe will say, oh, he, he being an Angami also is coming and working for all of us. We are thankful to Angami people. Now, if we start doing positive work, then tribalism immediately will disappear. Mm. But because we don't do that, we just use tribe in ex as an excuse to hate one another. So it is, a, uh, and once you started, once you start hating each other, you give up your sense of ownership and responsibility to your own place. Mm. Why environmental uh, uh, concern and why we need to prioritize and understand everything is because, see, and this touches again on education also. When our forefathers uh, did not have education or when they did not have any form of um, outer influences there they were educated by the flowers by the trees by the way uh, mm. the sun and the stars natural education uh, yeah so whenever the one flower bloomed they knew it was time to start to plant a certain seed it was a trigger and they knew when um, the return monsoon will come when the uh, uh, when the right monsoon will set in. So they had timing for everything and they knew everything. If this is known as uh, uh, cultural resource mapping, when you can map all the names of the stones and all the uh, mountains, the names of the river. Today, my generation and my elder generation are at fault for not being able to transfer this knowledge. Mm. to the next generation and we'll say the next generation will forget everything but what have we really done about that we have mm. not done anything now if you don't know the importance of where uh, the water were flowing where the rivers were flowing out of greed if we just divert one water one river stream and uh, try to create landslide in one area and if we want to uh, cut something and then create a mine um, coal, just because it's uh, just saying that it's bringing in money, we are doing it at the cost of destroying the environment for the next uh, generation. Right, right. And think about how our forefathers would have come and settled here saying, this is the land, the place where my future generation, my children, my grandchildren, mm will survive and thrive here. But now we are no longer farming. We are no longer taking care of this place. We are just uh, uh, taking money from external source and we are going around trying to mm. say that we want to develop this land. How much can you develop any land beyond what God has made it naturally? When God made, made it naturally, there are water veins. These water veins is where when storm happens, all the water is supposed to flow in this water vein. But we divert that water route. See, if you, if you see the road construction, we might say, okay, for vehicular uh, purposes, we're building four lane, it looks good, everything is fine, but you see the road. Normally, if there was no road, at every turning, whenever it rains, there will be small, small culverts created naturally and all the water will flow there. It will not get collected and go down to damage one point. At every section, water will flow. Mm. But now, because it's become a road construction, there is drain only on one side. And this drain will collect all the water and it will go and abnormally throw only in one area causing huge flood-like situation, flash flood-like situation, and it'll damage the, the uh, water below. It is not sensitive at all, the road construction also, because we are not, uh, we are not uh, allowing the water, the storm water to flow in the right uh, water vein. So, if these damages 
if we cannot reverse it, then just in front of our eyes, mountains after mountains will come down. If you see the Zubza and the, the hydro section also, the whole mountain is bugging. Mm. Now this, under this, we have the Disang Shale formation. The Disang Shale, if water penetrates into it, it becomes very unstable and it can cause mountain to come down. How would, right now, we would be able to, able to revert it but unless there is a strong commitment to revert this, uh, we will not be uh, able to save it. Similarly, uh, unless we understand what is our role and our, if you think that there are some people who, is going to, who are already on the job and worrying about it, then we are wrong. Mm. So we have to be concerned and to understand what are the things that we need to plan what are, uh, uh, how should we work out our waterways in such, uh, in such a way that uh, we can again restore the ecosystem? How do we actually, even if you have two acres of land, you can start a stream, a small rivulet. Mm. It is about understanding how to really work. There's a system of redeveloping uh, the forest. We call it um, the Miyawaki uh, system. So there is a Japanese guy who has understood how forest system works and all the trees in the forest are connected by a network of fungal microbacteria and they call it mycorrhiza network. And when you do a zoom culti uh, 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 cultivation slash and burn and you burn it, you also burn the beneficial microbes. Mm. When you burn the beneficial microbes, the leaves dropping on the ground, no, and it has got no purpose. It, nothing is going to convert it into the nutrient. See, forest needs, has no fertilizer, need no fertilizer, but the forest need this microorganism and a forest fire can destroy all these microorganisms. If it is destroyed, it will take a long time for it to get replenished. So, we cannot just justify saying slash and burn is a traditional practice because Amazonians in the in the uh, in the forests of uh, Brazil used to justify saying slash and burn was a traditional practice, and they realized that it was only in the last five hundred years it was a traditional practice. Before that, pre the Incans, uh, the Incas, the Aztec Indians, and all they had. Uh, a civilization, a civilization right in the middle of the Amazonian forest, mm. which was so large, an area the size of France. And they had made the soil, physically they had uh, altered up to six feet of soil, and they turned it into uh, a soil called terra preta, mm. which is the only man-made soil in the world that can regenerate all the nutrients. So people were not doing slash and burn for small communities it's okay but as community as population increases this burning of forest and destroying of the microorganism and the soil exposing the soil is the most dangerous uh, this thing and uh, uh, diverting the uh, water sources uh, there is a austrian scientist victor schauberger who has illustrated and shown that if you remove the stones, the rocks, the big boulders from the middle of the river, it causes erosion onto the sides. And this is what is happening in our Chate River and all now. Mm. We have removed all the big boulders that used to be there. When we were growing up, we used to see a lot of those big right. boulders. <clears throat> we have removed all those boulders from the middle of the river and the river erosion is spreading to the site. Because if these big boulders was, uh, were there in the middle of the stream, it creates a vortex as water comes in heat. And the vortex action, it removes, it deseals all the, uh, from the base, uh, from the riverbed, it deseals all the soil mm. and it takes it down. So, we have to be, uh, for the young generation, protection of our water resources, our rivers, our forests, 
everything has to be of uh, primary concern because when we think that uh, our land as a resource is our strength when we say tourism as a potential mm, mm. we are looking at tourism from the natural beauty also right we are not not just looking at tourism from a cultural perspective yes just on its own how much uh, economy zuku itself is able to generate with us without us having nothing to do mm. but just to uh, protect it and keep it preserved so that mm. people do not damage it so similar similarly all over nagaland there's so much of diverse uh, beauty uh, diverse uh, uniqueness to uh, each and every region mm. and this is where i feel preserving the environment is very important for us and it, uh, it will also for the next generation this is some thing where once we preserve it with little or no effort we should be able to generate economy mm. uh, by just being sentinels of our environment i think uh, it's a it's like a big wake up call right like you were saying it's it we are at a stage where it's not like it's not too late mm. to you know act on it and uh, also quite um, sad to see how as a race of people we were once so in tune with nature and had high regard for it and now at a point where it seems like almost blatantly disregarding just for a quick profit or whatever for the lack of not wanting to do hard work just destroying our environment at that cost and uh, you were like because i didn't want to disturb your flow but when you were touching on tribalism so just not to get too negative and all but uh, it is what it is and uh, tribalism and for me i have repeated this on the show several of times that for me i feel this is one of the b- biggest hindrances to us progressing as a people confined it to whatever you want to call it political boundaries or whatever it is but uh, i feel tribalism is one of the biggest factors and uh, it it clearly shows um, although you know our state motto might be unity although we tend to get together for uh, for the cameras if you want to call it that but what do you think of uh, you know you touched on it a little bit earlier but how big a po- uh, threat does this pose for you or do you think this is just something that you know we have to live with or no this is part of human nature actually it will be racist also no division created based on the religion also based on caste mm. based on race and uh, this tribalism for us also uh, if we want to create division it is very easy mm. but you have to understand people come to this hornbill festival <clears throat> not just because they want to see some performances but actually we are also one unique place where so many tribes get together it is very rare all over the world tribes everybody knows that uh, wherever tribes exist there's not much of harmony mm. in any of the countries uh there's always conflict mm. and these are also the characteristic of being tribals mm. so so this tribalism issue it exhibit itself in various form all over the world mm. be it races be it division uh, based on uh, religion be it based on caste mm. so we have to understand that if we use the difference as this unity it is to our loss mm. but if you show our difference as uniqueness in terms of unity then right right we will stand to benefit and we are not nagas are not unreasonable people mm. at heart each and every tribe is always forgiving and there's not much of difficulty with working with one another and this is why 
we have been able to coexist for so long. Mm. There's always a sense of brotherhood. What I feel, though we proudly call ourselves headhunters and warrior tribe, we are uh, also very, in a sense, like we have this sense of gratitude. We have the sense of uh, brotherhood. We have a sense of uh, coexistence. Mm -hmm. And people come to our Hornbill Festival not just to see the fest uh, just to see a festival, but to see so much of tribes coming together. It's a rare event, mm -hmm. and it is also it speaks in speak in volume about our unity also. Mm -hmm. Now. Uh, one, uh, without thinking deeply, we might uh, be insensitive, we might start uh, saying something that might hurt one tribe. Mm. And suddenly in this age of social media where we can always uh, take an issue and create a mountain out of it, mm. as if uh, uh, from a self-righteous perspective we can just uh, we love to condemn mm. and we should not allow to, this to happen and one thing is also because of our dependence on easy money and our, uh, we see tribalism uh, the ugly head of tribalism most when it comes to government appointment, government mm. jobs, <clears throat> and all this thing. We don't see tribalism in a lot of uh, other areas, but uh, when it comes to these government funds and all this thing, we see a lot of tribalism. And these are some type, we should not allow the younger generation to become a bondage of this yeah, issue. To inherit this mm. the thing that's been... Because these issues are created by some people who want to benefit something out of it. See, there was a saying, when you see an issue, you should not just try to see who that issue is affecting, but you should also try to study whom, to whom that issue is benefiting. Mm -hmm. So people create issues in the name of some people who are victim, but those people who are creating the issue are benefiting in another way. So everything is sometimes... We have to be very careful about this thing because there is always a vested agenda. Vested interest, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And we have to look and work towards solution that benefits everyone and not uh, try to get a uh, fine problem in everything. Like I mentioned earlier, if as a tribe, if we start working for each other, mm -hmm. the next generation will be uh, grateful and we'll have this message that that, that tribe came and helped our tribe when mm. we were having problem when we were facing this when we have the time even amongst villages we should organize some feasts or some get together so that if ever communities have a problem they will remember those good times together and mm. solve it mm. Otherwise, all these ho-hos, they only meet in times of crisis. Mm. Let the ho-hos meet in good times. Let them organize. No? Right, they have been right. set up not just to handle crisis. The ho-hos should organize fees to bring uh, different tribes together. Mm. They should have some festivities. Everything need not be funded by the government. It should be patrons should come in and say, I'm going to host food for uh, get together of my tribe and your tribe. And so mm -hmm. like that, good deeds need to be done so that if there are examples, healing will come among our people. We have, we are, we have not gone into a situation where things are so bad between us. God forbid, uh, if ever some uh, misunderstanding occur, because for us, we have come into a situation where issues can spiral out of control mm. on social media. Especially with social media. And people mm. don't even that. bother to see if the facts are correct or not. Mm. People are just bored 
idle, they just want to react to everything. And this, uh, this can create a lot of issues. So keeping this in mind, all tribal organizations should work towards uh, kind of a collective unity, collaborative uh, thing to do together. Yeah. Mm. I think that's very, very well and beautifully put. Uh, the strength obviously should lie in our unity, but uh, I think we also have a lot to work on as a people and also maybe a time for reflecting, self-reflection, because like what you said about earlier, way back in the conversation, you were saying, if not me, then who? To, you know, to actually do something or to step up and, uh, you know, uh, bear the responsibility or take take lead on that. So I think that's something that we can all think about also. Uh, we have a lot of topics that, you know, uh, we have skimmed through, which I wanted to go more in depth into. But obviously, because of time constraints, we couldn't go so much into it, which I hope that we can have a future independent series of that yeah. with Richard Bello and Richard Bello and some uh, specific topics. But we'll, you know, slowly wrap this conversation up yeah. with one uh, interesting thing that I found when we had this discussion over the phone um, and you said you have this perspective on life or you look at situations like it was a video game. Yeah. And how, you know, there's like an algorithm and you can, yeah, you're looking to fix the problems through this. I found that a very interesting perspective to have. And so could you like shed some more light on that? Like how you, how you came to have that perspective and. Yeah, over the years growing up, I also played a lot of video games, mm. strategy based. Um, and in every game scenario there used to be a certain algorithm which you have to master and um, you can even alter the scenario and then still see how you can uh, uh, play and you can choose to play whether with a cheat code or whether with a hard level whether uh, right. easy level you can choose so live presented to me itself like a video game only mm. You can just simulate a situation. That's why I tell my boys also, um, people who work with me, to uh, put yourself in a survival mode where you're dealing from your... Uh, just assume that there's no one out here to help you. Mm. And then uh, you are at distress level. And then you, uh, you have a, uh, just a small thing, a small fun to start with. So in that kind of simulation, uh, we put ourselves, practically put ourselves in that kind of simulation. Mm. We took some small, small shops uh, near Naga Hospital and uh, different, different places. And we started with just basic one cylinder and one uh, guest stove. And then we wanted to see if we can uh, do enough to pay the rent of the house. So. Uh, like a real life simulation of a video game. <laughs> uh, this is how um, my process of learning had been just to throw ourselves into the uh, simulation. And then as the process went along, I also learned uh, that this is how the uh, real world, world also works. Everything has got an algorithm and we have to learn how that algorithm works. Mm. Like, why is it more uh, easy for an uneducated person to become successful in life then for a fully educated person to be unsuccessful it is because the person who did not go to proper schooling is looking and studying the algorithm of life he's studying successful people he's studying uh, who who they should network with how people would trust, how people would respect. You know, like uh, I've um, used this uh, reference also before um, about respect and trust. Respect to if you have money also. Even if people don't you know you, just by designation also people will respect you. But trust is something very hard to earn. Trust, to, you can, uh, you have, really have to work for that trust. So, when you study how successful environment are or how people are, uh, how the world is going by, then you 
slowly learn that these are certain traits that you need to acquire. Mm-hmm. So like a sim, sim city or sim, uh, <laughs> like a simulation, you have to understand that the easy one though, <clears throat> on a use and throw basis, you can get into anywhere. But the moment you try to manipulate people, the moment you try to get away by cheating with someone and then you know, think, thinking that you go on a long way, sooner or later, everything is uh, put into your own account only. And you're going to get to not meet that people that whom you have cheated at a certain point of time. So they are also going to uh, catch up with you. So when you understand algorithm, you get to understand which one to prioritize, how to prioritize. Every day, uh, uh, new opportunities of earning are it's coming out. But schools no, have not been able to update their algorithm. That is why... They say today students are not able to concentrate, but it is not the students' fault. It's because information, the speed at which people can process information mm. has become very fast. The schools are not able to cope up with that. So a 45 minute period is just too long to just deliver that much of information. Right. So everything, just as uh, how video game is also, Video game always keep up, updating version 1.1, version 2, version 3, version 4. Schools also should be updating its uh, algorithm at the same pace. And the pers- for every individual, we have to upgrade our algorithm. Mm. There was a time when people never thought uh, much about computers. And then suddenly, uh, everyone everyone had to learn at least how to use a computer. Now people are not really thinking about artificial intelligence, but artificial uh, artificial intelligence has come in in a very big way. So we must be uh, we must we must understand what how the environment around us are changing and how we have to cope with it. This is where the survival mentality kicks in. And this is where like the whole uh, video game environment comes in. Like you have to choose which uh, armor to buy, which uh, thing to upgrade, mm-hmm. which skill you need. So this is my uh, computer game class. <laughs> Your theory. Yeah. All right. Nice perspective. I mean, uh, by the looks of it, uh, it seems like you've got a lot of things figured out. So it looks like you're living life on cheat code. Final wrap up question: What what does the future hold for Richard as a on on a personal level? Uh, like, what are some of the things that you're looking to do personally, and then as a professional level, obviously with Zynoric and uh, maybe some other things that you have lined up. What what are your briefly new uh, near and distant yeah. plans? Wait. With my architectural uh, activity, uh, the main, we have our team, Paragon Prime, led by Kribu, and um, they are doing good work. I've been able to groom them, and then they've become an independent unit. We have Imti, Imti Jamir also, he's also uh, doing well on his own. And... uh, with the Green Caravan team, uh, which is headed by Manen, Manen also come, no? Okay. This is where the Green Caravan activity is where I'll be also be putting my energy in the farming sector. Mm. This is where uh, our farmers need help at this point of time. The younger generation also, progressive farmer also need guidance. The government at, uh, is giving all its best Right from the Ministry of Agriculture, they're putting all the money, whatever is required. And uh, we want to ensure that uh, the, the the farmers and uh, they are the maximum beneficiary and they plan out the environment right. Mm. If we plan our agri activities wrong, it will again be devastating for our environment. Bamboo architecture is something that I have always been working on and it is, you know, for me, it is the uh, real sustainable material of the future. 
keeping in perspective climate change and also uh, earthquakes. Mm -hmm. So any uh, calamities, we have to, eventual calamities, we have to be prepared and we must be uh, uh, resilient enough to overcome it. Some people uh, think like, because I keep sharing about updates about earthquakes and the weather, the weather. You have become the... They think I'm the harbinger of uh, that, <laughs> the, the prophet of doom. And uh, uh, sometimes people think like that. See, I share these things for people to be aware, mm. for people to know what is happening. This time, uh, the weather changes that is happening is actually the return, kind of a delayed monsoon supposed to come in uh, uh, no uh, October, November. So it's coming in late. And also, uh, we had El Nino, Super El Nino last year. This year, we are headed for La Nina. So these are weather changes that we have to be prepared. When you are prepared, there's not much of um, devastation. Uh, there's not much of... Um, uh, nothing really happens. Like earthquake does not kill people building. Mm, uh, mm. kills people more. Right. So when you are prepared, that means you are resilient. It's just about preparing communities for that. So bamboo is something that uh, I'll be working on. And uh, environmental uh, protection, um, the, the restoring our forests, uh, making our forests in such a way that it is sustainable. Like, uh, it's not just blindly uh, protecting the forest because a forest fire can burn everything. So it is making a, a forest, planning it well in such, in such a manner that even if forest fires come, uh, we are able to protect it and then uh, conserving the water. The water is one of the most important issues. So mm. I want to work with the young about this environmental management and protection how to how do we go about it so these are the immediate thing in the inside, inside in for you no we have reached the end of a very fascinating episode for me mm. i mean i was very immersed in whatever you were saying and that's that's why i honestly mean like you know i hope we can have a separate uh, series or something like that where we can do something with uh, i would love to update you and your team also and to your viewers also mm. whenever we get an opportunity uh, to take you to the site i invite your team to come so that we can see what we are doing and how it is a journey uh, where we all have to walk together and learn together mm. i am not uh, a business environment also and i'm not also uh, uh, an organization in that sense I, mm -hmm. I like I like working with anyone uh, all my team is comprised of people who wants to start their own company very soon mm -hmm. and most of them have been able to start their own companies also and That's they work nice. with me mm -hmm. and uh, most of them continue working with me and I like grooming them because I believe that the, the real tribalism issue and all these things will disappear when we start lifting each other up. Mm. If I want to be the boss and I want to put everyone under me, then I already have an agenda. Right. So, uh, but if I lift you up, if you're a stranger and I lift you up, then you'll be like, oh, there's no agenda here. There surely will be no agenda. So, unless we approach our Nagaland in that kind of with that kind of attitude without taking into consideration which tribe you are from or where you are from but when we start helping each other with a genuine uh, sense and with a purpose that is linked to the future generation to the unborn generation then we will be able to uh, dream of a better future if mm. we don't do that now then we cannot dream of a better future so right. This is my... I think uh, you've already said it in part, but like we will definitely be following you up with, with that. Like, uh, you know, come visit your site or, or some other site where you're working and document that also. Uh, we end with a segment called the messages. 
Okay. So these are just uh, I I like to give you the time to give a message to one family or friends, mm. and second, uh, basically the nagas in general. I think you've given a lot of messages we we should be able to learn from, but one more message to maybe nagas in general. If everyone was tuned in right now listening to you, yeah. what would your message be? So my first message is to my wife. She has been the most uh, tolerant, adjusting in in every way, allowing me to do whatever I want to do, to move with all our support. To my children, Eva, Elezo, and Kikunyo, Isabel. To my foster mother and my father. Sibu Bello and Prezo Francis. It's it's a long journey, but I manage. All this thing on the with your unconditional support, you know. This is personally <coughs> I I am very uh, when it comes to acknowledgement and, and being grateful. We are weak. This is this is, this is one area where I don't acknowledge. But in my heart. I work for people because the love that I have given, uh, that I have got from people, have been undeserving, you know. People I didn't know who were not family or even family. Everyone came in to help me. I keep telling my friends it's like uh, life is a cheat. Cheat code for me because everything that uh, I am today is um, it's not purely merit. We work hard, but people help us more. People support it, and everything has been unconditional. The family has been unconditional and they just I used to study uh, everyone stood by me and just tolerated me you know my demands are unreasonable and my team members team they all everybody knows I push people to their limit 
I'm like your heart taskmaster. And this is when I think I know I keep telling them I know you guys it has reached here you are just one step away from running away and we just push because the future generation is unborn nobody will understand but this is it and to all everyone who has been with us who has helped us and, and I don't I've never come any, across anyone who has been against also it's I'm just grateful to all of them and to all the mentors Uncle Vilele Late Sir Norman Butzere Sir Abio Giri even our Chief Minister all of them Sir Kiketo even Sir Im Kung Lemba, Sir Lam Temchi, and Sir Tem Jin Toy, he late Sir Tem Jin Toy. They took time out to share something that was beyond that necessity also, but in the process, they group me. People say uh, we are connected to a lot of important people, but it's not. That's not the case also, but they favor. And also, uh, Sarah Chalevia, even Madam Anu, so. Everyone has taken their time off their normal this thing to sit down to mentor us to tell us when we go wrong and this is like I'm always grateful and this is the reason why sometime every day when when I get up and start my day I don't have an agenda people talk about what are your visions what are your plans? I am. I get in my dream. I get guided. I'm guided. I see what uh, I have to do tomorrow. But beyond that, I don't have any an agenda. I don't have a, a plan of building up a big organization. But I just think that the younger generation of Nagas deserve better than what we got. We grew up in a time of uncertainty and we grew up in a time of political agenda. The young does not deserve what we went through. So I think this is my message. And to the young also, I'm just telling them, I keep telling them, have a sense of ownership. Don't listen to everything that is played out in the social media. Don't listen necessarily to all the negative things that is happening around us. We only become what we want to become. The society will become whatever we want it to become. We can throw ourselves or condemn ourselves into 
small, small tribes, insignificant, useless, or we can work towards a bigger nation which is always standing for each other and helping each other out and growing as strong tribe in the face of humanity. We can just become what we choose to become. And if you see today, we have just become a very negative uh, community. We are becoming that unless we are careful, unless we start working hard personally and unless our contribution are tangible and meaningful, we can never hope to see a better society. So don't ever find yourself idle. Don't ever find yourself uh, in a victim position or uh, in a, with a victim mentality. And work hard because with work culture, we can change the future. Without, uh, without that, without uh, God's blessing, we cannot proceed further. Without putting our effort, we cannot expect God, God's blessing. And for a good uh, future, we can only claim uh, only when we have put in our effort. So this is my only request to the younger generation. Work hard and put in your best. Yeah. <clears throat> For the first time, I think in you know in the past twenty seven episodes that I've done, this whole message section is usually just people just say you know thank you friends, friends and family, and then they give a shout out, nice little message here and there. But I'm also I was I, I'm at, still at a loss for words because yeah. I found it I found it really uh, heart heart touching. Like you know like it was the honesty in that, and for you to put it out there, I wanna. Thank you, Richard, for you know taking the time out of your busy schedule to uh, join for this conversation. I learned so much, and I hope and pray that you continue to contribute to our people in our state. As selfish as it may sound, in you know in in all the many things that you're doing, and uh, I hope to talk to you soon again. So thank you once again. Yeah, thanks so much.